From years of anxiety to warrior and mentor, Bradley Robinson created the Anxiety Project to help you end your anxiety naturally. Let's mold the new you and let's end anxiety together. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Project podcast number 102. I am Brad Robinson. Today's episode is all about panic, panic attacks. And I want to bring you back to a moment in my recovery from anxiety where I was suffering severe panic attacks weekly. And I want to talk about what not to do, what I was doing wrong when dealing with panic, but also what I was doing unconsciously right. And there was a moment where I was handling panic the right way and I didn't even know it. And so the recovery process is all about gaining knowledge about anxiety, gaining knowledge about panic. What is panic? So I had to become a student of myself, of anxiety. What is it? Why am I experiencing these things? And I didn't choose it. It came to me. I had no other choice. I had to take on this responsibility of learning all about this anxiety, all about panic, so that I can overcome it, right? Because anxiety has been a huge part since I was a kid. And so now as a coach, as a mentor, I'm giving you and explaining how I overcame anxiety, but also how other people overcame panic attacks. What's the solution? What do we do? Now, I want to bring you back to a moment where Maggie and I were going to symphonies and I was experiencing severe panic at the beginning when I first started going to these concerts. Now, during the concert, when I would sit there with Maggie, the lights turned down, everything became dead silent. It hit me. I'm trapped here. There's no way out. And then I felt strange. I felt strange. I checked in on myself. And I checked in on myself with concern. I noticed that I was having difficulty getting enough oxygen, breathing. And then I noticed, you know, my, my head is feeling light, tingly. And then all of a sudden, I would get these words. And I remember these words. They always came into my mind before severe panic. The words are, oh, no. Oh, no. That self-talk, the self-talk of, oh, no, was the icing on the cake. It meant I'm trapped here. This is not good. And I got to get out of here. So I basically told myself with, oh, no, something is wrong. And this sent me into full-blown panic. And when I was sitting there in the symphony, I didn't know it was panic because all of these thoughts emerged and not just thoughts, it's also sensations as well. And the sensations uh, were easily misinterpreted as something's wrong. Something is wrong. And then the feelings and the sensations enhanced. And thoughts like, what if I vomit? What if I faint? Just come about because then you start to feel like vomiting. You start to feel like fainting. And it's not because you're going to faint or because you're really going to vomit, but it's those feelings caused by anxiety that snowball your anxiety more and more. So I was sitting there 
stuck in this box of, of my mind. And I was terrified. And little did I know, I developed a fear of being trapped in situations that involve many people. There were also two other fears underlying that fear, which was the fear of dying, but also the fear of humiliating myself in front of these people while I die. The fear of humiliating myself and causing a scene was so great in that moment while I was sitting in that concert that I decided to stay there and I avoided and I shut down the idea of getting up and leaving because I was sitting with Maggie. I was watching the concert, but not, not really watching. I was so internal. Um, and so I shut the idea of getting up and leaving because I really wanted to leave. But I had such a great fear of getting up and then humiliating myself by getting up because no one else was getting up. Everyone was there. It was packed. Right. And I didn't want to make a scene. I didn't want to cause any attention towards myself. But I was also fearful of fainting on the way out as well. So there was this situation where I really felt trapped in my own mind. So I had no idea while I was sitting there, remaining in my seat, I had no idea that I was engaging in a powerful strategy. I was rewiring neuronal pathways in my brain while I remained seated. I was showing my fear response that there is no real danger and that I can survive. The technique is called flooding. Flooding is when you subject yourself to your worst fears and you don't leave. You don't run away. You remain there until your anxiety lessens and lessens and lessens, right? So why not leave? You feel horrible. You feel trapped in your own mind and your own body. Why subject yourself to that torture? Well, Remember that what we act out attaches value to that act. So if I was to get up and walk out of the symphony, I would have told my fear response, this situation is a threat to my life and it needs to be avoided. And when you do this enough times, you get up, you leave when you feel uneasy. You won't want to leave your home eventually. And this is agoraphobia, which I developed myself. Because in my past, how I handled panic was I felt panic, I felt uneasy, and then I left. And then you keep doing that, you're strengthening this attachment to your emotions and the environment you're leaving, right? The, the emotions of the, that fear, that uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortableness, right, of being in that environment and in that environment in, it's, itself. So I was attaching these two t together. And so the more I avoided those situations, the more I, I just stayed at home, I stayed in my safe zone. Everything outside became fearful. And when I would leave these anxiety producing situations, I recognized later on that these situations all had a common theme. They all had people in it, and I felt trapped. Very interesting. I remember the art gallery incident where I was in an art gallery with Maggie, 
bunch of people downtown feeling trapped, feeling the anxiety sensations. Even before the art gallery panic attack, I was in the mall in my hometown, my home city, and I had a panic attack and I left. I didn't know what it was, but I left. I, I felt horrible. And then there's another time where I was in a workshop and I had a panic attack while sitting there. I felt uneasy. Lots of people in a, in a, in a environment with feeling trapped. And then I got up and then I left. And so I recognized these themes. And now the fear of these situations strengthen more and more and more every time you avoid it. That's why I always use the baby dragon metaphor. You avoid slaying the baby dragon when it's young. What happens? You avoid it. It grows up. And then it's too big to handle. And then it burns down the whole town. You could have slayed the dragon at the beginning. I could have stayed in the environment from the get-go. But I didn't. I kept avoiding, avoiding, and then eventually the panic and fear was so big that it was way more difficult to handle those anxiety-producing situations. So let's go and talk about the amygdala now. The amygdala is this fear response. It's the part of the brain that triggers that fear, that anxiety. The amazing thing is we can unlearn the fears that hold us back. We can unlearn them. That's amazing because our brains are plastic. That We, we can rewire their, their neuronal pathways within our brains. So by remaining in my chair at that symphony, I was slowly unlearning those fears that popped up. The message you want to send to the amygdala is that you won't die in this situation. All those times running out of the mall, the art gallery, school, even work, I was unconsciously sending the message to my amygdala. These situations are uncomfortable and they need to be avoided. In other words, this is a threat to my life. Let's not go back there. Very powerful. Now, the amygdala makes associations between the environment and your emotions toward it. So when I would leave the classroom because I was feeling anxiety, I was feeling panic, my emotions were fear, right? Fear. I was afraid. And so the amygdala then attaches that environment to those emotions. So whenever I was in an, an environment like the classroom, those same emotions would come up. The fear res response would activate. So the classroom is a situation where there's a lot of people, you feel trapped, and then the mall is not a classroom, but it resembles the same kind of situation. The mall, there's lots of people, you feel trapped. Or the concert, the symphony, where I was, not a classroom, but same kind of situation. Lots of people feeling trapped. The same fears come up. And so that's really interesting. And what's really interesting is when you when you tackle one of these fears, one of these situations that make you anxious, you tackle all the situations. So you just find one scenario, one environment 
that makes you feel anxious and tackle that one environment. Don't go out, if you want to, you can, but don't go out and, and, and tackle many different ones. Find just one place, one scenario that makes you feel anxious and go tackle it. Very, very powerful because when you overcome that anxiety producing situation, you can become braver in all the other situations that make you feel anxious. Really powerful. So I kept going back to the symphony. Even though it made me feel uneasy, I kept going back there. It's amazing that each time I went back to the symphony, my anxiety lessened and then it lessened and then it lessened. And I had to keep going back over and over and over again so that my panic lessened. I was showing the amygdala that I am not going to die here. I can survive. And so you don't just stick a sword in the fire and hammer it one time. That's not how you forge a sword. You have to keep sticking the sword in the fire over and over and over again. And then you have to hammer it over and over and over again a dozen times or so to forge a sword. That's how you rewire the mind. You have to keep exposing yourself. Place yourself in the fire over and over and over again. That's the flooding technique. That's how you overcome fear. You don't overcome fear by avoiding. That only strengthens that connection. You don't want to strengthen that connection. You want to break that connection. You want to prove that you won't die. That's the new pathway you're creating. You're overcoming your fears. You're becoming braver. And so when you overcome, when I overcame my fear of being in that symphony and experiencing the panic, experiencing the sensations, when I overcame that scenario, I became braver in all other scenarios. Oh, if I can handle the symphony, oh, I can go to the movies. I, I, I can handle that. And so I went to the movies, but you know, I still felt anxious in the movies, but I didn't run away. It wasn't as great as before. So the more you just keep going out there and exposing yourself to these situations that make you feel anxious, you can do it all at once. You can just keep going and going and going, which, which is great. But the reason why I said before, just pick one scenario is because when you really tackle and overcome one fearful situation, the all, all the other ones that you were avoiding before become way less anxiety producing. You become braver, more confident. I am able. That's what comes into your mind. I am able to overcome these other ones because I proved to myself that, hey, I sat through that symphony. I can overcome this scenario. I can survive even though I feel awful, even though I feel trapped in my own mind. I can overcome this situation. So keep placing yourself in that fire. And I promise you a new side of yourself, a braver, more confident you will emerge. And that's where I'm going to leave you on today's podcast episode. Thank you for being here with me today. And remember, do not let anxiety define who you are. I will see you on the next podcast episode. Bye for now. 
Brad's powerful anxiety recovery program is available at unpluganxiety.com. The Anxiety Project program is downloadable and puts the power of anxiety recovery in your own hands. What are you waiting for? Visit unpluganxiety.com for more details. Recovery starts now.